Go ahead, Todd. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ontology Summit 2021. Today is 10 March uh, 2021. And this is one of the sessions for track A, the ontology landscape. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from Claudio Mozello. He's a researcher at the Laboratory for Ont Applied Ontology of the Institute of Cognitive Sciences and Technologies of the Itali oh, excuse me, Italian National Research Council. And of course, they're located in nice, friendly Trento, Italy. He got his PhD in information engineering under the scope of a co-tutorship program between the universities of Padova in Italy and Toulouse in France in 2000. His main research interests concern the ontological foundation of knowledge engineering and conceptual modeling with a particular focus on qualitative representation of space, time, change, and properties, as well as ontological foundations of cognitive theories. He's a co-founder of the IAOA, that is the International Association of Ontology and its Applications, and he's a member of the editorial board of the Applied Ontology Journal. And of course, he's published numerous papers in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. Uh, Claudio is joining us from Trento. I assume it's Trento today. So Claudio, if you could start with your wonderful presentation. Okay. Many thanks, Todd, for the introduction, and also to Ravi and Ken for inviting me to to have this talk at this Ontology Summit. Then today I will talk a little bit about um, um, the principle that guided the, the development of Doge. Then we, I will not really enter into the details of what are the categories of relations uh, and the axiomatization of the Doge ontology, but more on the methodological and the idea behind the Dolce ontology. Then, uh, Dolce is a, a descriptive ontology for linguistic and cognitive engineering that has been developed in, in the context of the WonderWeb project, and that is a project of the European Commission that is titled Ontology Infrastructure for the Semantic Web. And it ended, ended in 2004, then it's quite old project. Um, the first release of Dolce has been done in 2002, and the second and definitive release of Dolce has been done in 2003, then just one year after. And uh, there are really very few differences between the two releases. Then uh, from this release, Dolce didn't change, basically. And you can find some information about Dolce, some documentation about Dolce in the, uh, at this page. And it's a quite old page because Dolce is quite old now, um, but uh, you have additional information. In 2009, I, together with other colleagues at the Laboratory for Applied Ontology, have done a sort of uh, update of the Dolce, is more of the core part of the Dolce, and of the very high level categories of, and the very basic relation of Dolce. Mm, it's more a simplification that, uh, but this has not been uh, released as an, is not an official release of Dolce, let's say. And clearly there are also a lot of uh, extension of Dolce that has been developed by me or colleagues of me at the laboratory, but also by other people in, in, in the world, let's say, that took Dolce and extended it with new entity, kind of entities and this kind of stuff. And right now, there is also an ongoing user standardization activity. I'm not directly involved in it, but basically, ISO is, uh, is uh, doing a sort of multi-standard that, uh, uh, that take into account the standardization of several top-level ontologies. One is Deutsche, there is also BAFO and uh, other ontologies involved in that. I'm, I don't know all the details because I'm not uh, directly involved in this activity. Okay, and then even though I will talk about the principle uh, behind the Dolce, let's just uh, have a look at the basic category of Dolce, just to have an idea. Then it's very high level, uh, top level ontology with uh, few categories and very abstract, like object, event, uh, and uh, quality, and uh, different kind of events, different kind of object, uh, physical, non-physical. As you see, are uh, very few uh, categories at uh, quite high level. And uh, 
the, the main primitive relation of Deutsch are just six, and uh, also these relations are quite uh, general and uh, quite, uh, let's say, standard from an ontological perspective. Then there is a part of the relation, uh, and, uh, the temporary version of part of the relation, a constitutive, constitution relation, a participation relation, sort of inherence relation, and uh, this is Quale is called, there was a strange, uh, if you want to name, uh, that we decided, decided for this relation, but basically it's a localization of an entity into a, a region. If I have time, I will uh, say something more about this quality and the quale, but uh, I don't know. In addition to that, uh, however, there are a quite uh, huge and rich axiomatization. There are 70, 74 uh, axiom, and there are a lot of definition, uh, more than 100 definition inside Deutsch. Then it's quite uh, one of the characteristic of Deutsch is that it has a, a quite rich axiomatization, and with uh, a lot of definition and few primitives, but very high level primitive, very general primitive, very general categories, and. Uh, <clears throat> As I say, the, the Deutsch has been uh, developed in the context of the Wonder World project, and uh, the Wonder World project, one of the main uh, objectives of this project was the, de the development of a the infrastructure required for the large-scale deployment of ontologies as the foundation for the semantic web. Then it was during the period where the semantic web was very hot, and then uh, this was uh, an attempt to have a sort of um, holistic um, approach to a uh, semantic web. Then the interesting thing is that not only focus as uh, the, this person not only focuses on some aspect of the semantic web, but try to put together all the aspects required for a semantic web. And then not only languages, for example, one of the results uh, of, of, of the Wonder Web project is the first version of the OWL language that is now quite used. And but and then uh, uh, some tools and some service in order to 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 manage this language, but also ontologies and also ontology engineering, then methodologies in order to develop and to match and uh, to map between different ontologies. And this was quite a complex and interesting project in my in my perspective. In particular, the toolkit, then this, uh, this the idea that inside the tools uh, we have also a set of ontologies that cover a wide uh, range of application domains, and that can be used to to build a more detailed domain ontology and to integrate existing existing ontologies. I mean, the idea was basically okay that you don't need just uh, to 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 give uh, languages and to give uh, tools and methodology, but you need also to provide some content in addition to these languages in order to help people to develop a model and more uh, refined and more domain-specific ontology. Clearly, the problem was, okay, but which kind of ontology I can, uh, we, can we put inside this toolkit? And at the time, there was a, a huge discussion in the, in the ontological uh, community, uh, let's say, uh, even though the, the, the ontological community was quite small at the time, between what is called ontology with a big O and ontology with a small O. Okay? And basically, ontology with a big O is a theory, let's say, a theory of reality, and an ontology with a small O is in order to simplify it, like an, arbit an arbitrary model. Then basically philosopher was focusing more, and I think is also true um, today, okay, focus more on the nature of on the nature of the reality and then on different models of reality. Then in, in a sort of slogan B qua being versus content qua content. While computer science was interested in, uh, in developing new languages and then in the, on the nature of reasoning and on, not really on models. Models are just leaved to the end user. It was a sort of ontological promiscuity, let's say. In, 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 uh, then any agent creates its own ontology based on its usefulness for the task at hand. Then basically, modelization and um, representation is not an issue. You, every agent can do that. 
and um, from this small ontology, <laughs> small R ontologies. For the other side, the big ontology was, I know, but we need to refer to reality, and then there is just one ontology, is the ontology of reality. And our approach that we tried to, to follow was uh, in between these two uh, extremes, let's say, you know, then in order to allow a more pluralistic view, then to avoid then to have just a monolithic approach that presupposes a universe and a unique ontology of reality, but on the other side also avoids arbitrary models. And then you try to uh, the attempt was to provide some kind of uh, ontologies, okay, that I call with this circle O, uh, and uh, uh, that help people to produce well-founded models. And basically, this uh, position between these two extremes requires uh, at least, in my understanding, two shifts. Then the first shift is from ontology, and then with a big O, to this ontology with the circle O. Okay. Then, and this is basically the recognition that uh, not only pure metaphysical entities are relevant uh, in knowledge representation of our semantic web, but also more conceptual, cognitive, or hypothetical kind of entities are relevant in this context. And then uh, this requires that uh, there is no sort of absolute reality, but there are at least different reality of views that are useful. And uh, for example, for account to natural language, common sense, and et cetera. Okay. And this shift is similar to the one that has been done also in logic when you, st you have uh, and, uh, you, you shift from a sort of absolute truth and then the logic, there is one logic that explains all the, the reasoning mechanism to different logics with different truths and different reasoning mechanisms. That makes sense in specific contexts and, makes, and are able to present some kind of uh, mechanism, reasoning mechanism. The second shift is, okay, uh, the, the attempt to go in the direction to attempt to avoid, uh, let's say, um, um, arbitrary models. And then uh, the idea was to try to ground ontology with the smaller into this ontology we, 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 we want to introduce inside of this Wonder Web project. And then basically this uh, ontologies we want to, pro to produce with a circle door provide some conceptual handles to carry out a coherent and structured analysis of the domains of interest that help them to avoid ad hoc solutions that are used by, that might be are useful in specific kind of situation, but when you change a little bit on the domain of interest, uh, are not uh, no more um, valid uh, uh, representation, valid models. And then in this, this then basically is the attempt to avoid arbitrary models and to build well-founded models. Okay. And then there was these two shifts from uh, ontology from big org with this more pluralistic approach. And on the other side, no arbitrary model, but try to ground on models on this set of ontologies. Then an ontology, okay, with this circle, circle the all, is first of all for understanding each other, but not necessarily for thinking the same way. Then basically it also helps to recognize and to understand what are the disagreement, not all the agreements between different views, different realities, if you want, okay? And, uh, the second uh, feature of these uh, ontologies is, uh, is that is, they are philosophically and conceptually well-founded, and they explicitly characterize the basic assumptions they have. Then they are really based on a rich axiomatization that try to avoid the misunderstanding and misusing, and uh, clarify the semantic, I mean, pre make make precise the semantic and then is sort of semantically transparent with respect to the ontological commitment because the axiomatization is try to make precise what are these, these ontological commitment in a formal way. 
Okay. And uh, they have then a relatively large scope because uh, they need to be used in different contexts and they need to, to be used to ground different, um, um, different ontology with a small O, let's say. Then, clearly, in order to develop this kind of, of, of ontologies, that if you want, are, they can be, um, they are, seems quite similar to what uh, um, Todd called uh, foundational ontology in his talk. And also, we use this, this uh, term often, okay, in order to indicate this cycled ontology. We have uh, a very important uh, input that is the work done in philosophy. Okay, and there are a lot of philosophical analyses that take into account these general categories and this general relation, in particular, very basic relation like identity, part of dependence, constitution, participation, that are not uh, specific to a particular domain, but can be used in, uh, in order to characterize uh, on the ontological commitment uh, you uh, adopt in, in a specific, uh, from a specific point of view, or for a specific uh, requirement, or for a specific domain. And then uh, this uh, is uh, was a really an important uh, input for us, and then try to uh, study the philosophical literature on this kind of entities that uh, uh, often is also formal and is. And formalizing in, in some formal language in, in some logic. But in addition to that, we, we had a sort of a multidisciplinary approach where um, philosophy is one important input, but there are other inputs like uh, that can help in order to uh, build this foundation on the same. And these are, for example, linguistic, cognitive science, mathematics. And an example of that, for example, are, are the qualities of the qualia in Dolce, that uh, this, the, the whole mechanism behind these two kinds of entities is based, is based on the theory of conceptual space of Peter Gardenfors, that is a theory in cognitive science that try to explain how we categorize, for example, uh, object uh, entities in general, and also on linguistic studies. Uh, if um, maybe we, we will um, see an example later if we have the time. Then philosophy, but not only philosophy, also other discipline can be very um, important in order to try to uh, uh, develop this kind of ontologies. But clearly, when you move from uh, ontology with a big O, and, uh, and then uh, basically you have just one monolithic and standard uh, ontology. From ontologies with um, cycle law, from foundational ontology, and uh, you accept uh, that to have a different reality, a different view, you have the problems of manage this plurality of ontology, this set of ontology. And then the idea was uh, to, to have a sort of library of this ontology. And in, in our understanding of this library, the idea was to have a small set of ontologies that are not in, that are linked and justified and documented and positioned with respect to a space of possible choices. Then this ontology is not just given as a sort of flat and independent, um, a flat set and independent one from the other one but they are integrated uh, and uh, compared one with the other one, try to uh, understanding the differences and what are the, the, the peculiarities of each one of these view. And this basically uh, can be a very interesting starting point for building new ontology because you can reuse these ontologies and you can, or part of that, we, we say some say, I will say something more on modularization. And uh, there are also a reference point for an easy, rigorous comparison of, uh, among the different ontological choices because they are in this, this library of ontologies, in this library of ontologies, ontologies are integrated. Um, and then um, there are possible mappings between them that are uh, highlighted. And then this helps the semantic integration, at least partial interoperability. 
And also, basically, uh, this set, uh, this library also um, is in, represent a, a, a common framework that can be also extended, okay, and, and this sort of open library, you can add modules, add a new ontology on that. And, so, and then start to develop, you can start to develop a sort of common framework for analyzing, harmonizing, integrating existing ontology and metadata standards. And that also this increase the trust you have in this library. I will, I, I reuse here um, a picture that uh, I, in, in the original deliverable of 2003 of the Wonder Web project that illustrate uh, this idea of a library of ontology. And then basically you have two dimensions here indicated. One is the vision, let's say, and then you, you choose if you are a dimensionalist or a four dimensionalist, if you have uh, uh, tropes or not tropes, uh, if you have distinction between events and, and this different option basically allow you to choose one specific module, one specific ontology inside the, 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 the library. And uh, there are links between these different modules, okay, formal links between the different visions and modules. But there is also another uh, possibility, another dimension is to choose basically the topic of your, uh, of your ontology and you, you can select some part of ontology that are relevant, for example, for, the, for your specific domain. And in the original uh, Wonder Web library, we, because it was an European project, with not, not a big one, and we just illustrated this idea of the library with three of these uh, ontologies. One is Doce, the other one was Bafo. I don't know if uh, a lot of people know that Bafo was originally included in this uh, Wonder Web library. And the axiom, the axiomatization of this version of Bafo was, has been developed by Pierre Grenon in collaboration with Bear Smith and, uh, and me and other people at LOA that helped them to, to have this action. But uh, the, the, the current version of BAFO is quite different. If uh, I, I, I don't know all the details of the current, but they changed a lot of the axiomatization. And another uh, of these ontologies that has not been uh, developed anymore from, from this, that was developed by Luke Schneider, called Rock. And there was a, a modular, uh, as, as you see here, there is a sort of the modularity was really important. This, and this actually was mentioned in, in the Wonderworld project, but uh, we didn't really develop it a lot, this modularization aspect. Uh, actually, after the conclusion of Wonderweb, we, I personally, with, uh, in collaboration with Timo Sakoski and John Bateman at the University of Bremen, that was the developers also of Castle Ads, uh, that had some tools for, for specifying, uh, um, originally built for specifying a specification of algebraic specification of languages or, program, or programs. I have I've developed a, 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 a modularization of Deutsch that has also been used by Tim Sarkovsky of the Kurs in order to prove the consistency of Deutsch. But now there are a lot of, um, a lot, not a lot, but there are a few, <laughs> let's say, um, framework that uh, allow really to, to support modularization in a, in a nice way. One is uh, the Colore repository that is based on common logic and is developed uh, mainly by Michael Grunig at the University of Toronto. And the DOL, the Distributed Ontology Modern Specification Language, it is an OMG specification that is mainly developed by Timo Sarkovsky at the University of Marburg. And these, are, I think, are good example of how you can basically manage this modularity in a more refined way that we have done in the Wonder Web project. And interestingly, now I'm participating in a, in a, in a, in a new um, uh, project, uh, in an European project, it's called Ontocommons, Ontology Driven Data and Documentation for Industries Common. And the main goal is the standardization of data documentation across all domain related to materials and manufacturing, okay? And one of the main objective of this uh, uh, project is 
the developer of the ontology commons ecosystem for data documentation that includes a set of ontologies in addition to tools and uh, methodologies and uh, also in this case. And this uh, ontology common ecosystem, the top part, uh, ontological part of this ontology common system ecosystem is basically exactly the same idea of this library of top level ontologies. And it will contain Dolce Bafoemo and other uh, top level ontology are under analysis in order to be included inside this library. And this is mainly basically the same idea, more or less 20 years after the original idea in World Web. But also these ontologies are not just used uh, can in a knowledge representation or semantic web, but they, are, they can also be used and have been, have, have been used in order to clarify, for example, the semantic or conceptual model language in order basically to ground um, conceptual model language on, on ontological distinction, what is called an ontology driven conceptual model, as for example, onto UML developed by mainly by the group of Giancarlo Guizzardo, ontology design patterns developed by the group of Aldo Gangemi. And also to improve uh, the ontological foundation of lexical or vice versa to linguistically found the ontologies as we have done, for example, doing some alignments with com computation lexicon, in particular with coordinate in the project we call on the order. Then it's not, you don't need to see the, the role of ontologies with this circle adjusting for the semantic web, but in general for knowledge representation or conceptual modeling, I think. And then every, every time you need to develop a model. Okay, then one important uh, thing is that uh, the, uh, one important feature of this uh, circle or ontologies are the rich axiomatization. And, uh, and Nicola Guarino, especially, but also myself, uh, in some cases, um, and we use uh, some slogan like uh, ontological analysis study of is the study of the content quant content and that mainly says what must be bought, what must be be model needs to be studied, understood, and analyzed as such, independently of the way to be we represented and use it. And then, when you have done this ontological analysis, only when you have done this ontological analysis, you then can do knowledge representation. You can represent it. And basically, these slogans uh, suggest that. Uh, you can separate, clearly separate the ontological analysis from its form of representation and its use in application. Well, this is something I'm not more really convinced that I, I mean, maybe I've never been really convinced of this separation. Because it is true that, of, in one, that uh, more, most ontological analysis, especially in philosophy, in, uh, in analytic philosophy, is carried out in, in, uh, without uh, a, a clear formalization, a precise formalization. Maybe it's very precise as an analysis, but not formal. Okay. But in my experience, the formalization is extremely useful also to take into account, when, especially when you have, a, you need to represent very subtle distinction that are not clear at all at the beginning, then you need to specify them and to clarify them and to compare them and check if uh, the consequence of what uh, of uh, your choice, what are the consequences of your choices. And in this case, uh, it's really important to have a formalization, as is important also in order to make explicit and to communicate in an objective way, let's say, your analysis. And this goes in the direction also what the, of the role in general of ontology that uh, as to, Todd said in, in his talk uh, is about communication, not the only communication between machine or between human and machine, but also between humans. Okay, and then in my experience, uh, 
logic axiomatization plays play an important role at both the analytical level and the implementation level. You, you, you cannot really separate the analysis from the formalization of the analysis, in my understanding. You can do clearly, but for me, you, you, the, the, the idea to put together these two things is in a sort of uh, giving some feedback is, is really interesting and helps, you know, help, is really helping in in, uh, in uh, having a, 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 a really precise uh, uh, um, result. Okay. And then clearly in, in this perspective, then when you want to have a, a, a rich axiomatization and this rich axiomatization needs to be uh, done in a formal language. And this formal language is also basically on one side, uh, mm, influences in your analysis uh, on the other side influence also what you can do in, in at the implementation level when you use this ontology clearly is the choice of this formal language is problematic because from one side you want to have a, a, a very expressive language because in this case you can do a very good an analytical uh, analytical activity because you can better uh, you can hope to better characterize your primitives but on the other side in applicative terms for example night expressive power compromise the computational efficiency and then you start to not have any automatic inference uh, and classification in reasonable time and you have also this tension in the choice uh, of the formal language and uh, in the wonder web, we decided to separate the analytica for the implementation language. Then basically we started from a um, first order theory, model first order theory, that uh, basically allow, allowed us to, to, to have a, a good characterization of the primitive of Dolce. And then we approximate this first order theory in an owl, uh, using the owl logic our description logic that is much less expressive but has a good computational behavior. And then our hypothesis was, okay, because uh, it is important to have a good uh, an, an analytical uh, tool, I, we, we will use first order logic for the analysis and then we translate the theory we obtain in first order logic to a, a less expressive language just for, for, for the implementation uh, requirement. But I think this is something that is really complex. I don't have a solution, but I have some perplexity because we realized that, for example, automatic translation are very difficult to build. We worked with uh, um, uh, a researcher at the University of Bremen that was developing this kind of automatic translation, but uh, no result was really obtained and, and uh, also now I don't see very good uh, automatic translation because when you, you start to, to translate a first of the logic in our logic you have a lot of different possibilities in order to cut and to lose things and then this is very difficult. And also manual translation are difficult and uh, time consuming also the one we have done is is in, at, uh, in, in 2003 was really poor translation. Now for the standardization, for example, I know that a better approximation, but in any case, the big problem is approximation change, basically the meaning of primitives you have in your first order theory. And then basically, and often are also unable to capture most of the analysis represented in first order theory. Then here, I think there is a real issue in order to um, understand what to do in order to choose the language. In addition to that, also the ontological commitment of your theory can be seen as dependent of the formal language you, you use. I have a few examples and then I will end. And then in, in the sense that some entities or some kind of entities can be introduced into the domain of quantification 
to overcome a limitation of the language. And then basically you, you, you don't really you, you don't really want to this kind of entities, but if you introduce these kind of entities in this uh, uh, language that has a very low expressivity, you can uh, say something more. And this is quite relevant, uh, it's a quite relevant aspect uh, in, uh, in applicative terms. But clearly, if you if you yeah, if you take into account the Quine's maximum to be is to be a value of a variable, when you put these entities inside the domain of quantification, you can be uh, Quine would, would say, okay, but now you are you are uh, also committing this kind of entities. My perspective is that okay, maybe if you really like the Quine maxims, you can. You, you can say that you are committing on this one, but this kind of commitment is a little bit different from the commitment we have on the, the, the other kind of entities we have inside the domain, because these kind of entities are just here for technical reasons. I can give you two or three examples, and then I conclude. One example, for example, is, is, is quite common in, in description logic. You know that uh, you cannot express uh, any relation with n bigger than two, then basically you can express, uh, you have just binary relation in description logic. And then what happens if you want to represent an energy relation in, in description logic? When well, one possibility that uh, is now to use it is that basically when you have a, a relation that holds between R, that uh, bit, uh, holds between uh, and, and different entities, you basically introduce inside your domain, okay, a state of affairs or a factor, whatever you would call it, S. And this S is, uh, is of, of, uh, of a kind of R star that corresponds, is uh, univocally correspond to this relation R, then there is a sort of one-to-one -one relation. And then basically you introduce uh, an binary relation that links this S with the, the n entities of the of the of the, um, the n arguments of the relation. In this way, you are able to represent at least, or in, in a quite complex way, but to represent the the fact that, that this relation are also between a, a one and a n. Then in this case, our state of first part of the reality is really part of your ontological commitment or just introduced in order to represent the, 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 this relation that otherwise cannot be represented in description logic. Because in first of the logic, you don't have that. You just have A1 and AN and the relation R. Okay. A second, for example, motivation in order to introduce uh, this kind of, um, of um, of, of entities inside your domain is uh, imagine, for example, to re-express truth about the global political consequence of a decline in the gross national product of Eastern Europe in terms of interaction among fundamental and particles. This is an example of, um, that I took from Jane, John Hay and uh, his book in 2005. Then in this case, you can, okay, maybe you can do that. Maybe you can reduce this to fundamental particles, but this construction maybe is not expressible in the language you have chosen, or maybe it's too complex to be cognitively, humanly, or computationally managed. Then it may be, if you, you can, if you introduce inside your domain of quantification institution or uh, something much more general than just uh, particles, Maybe this entity does not exist, but all of you to say something about this gross national product of Western Europe that otherwise you cannot say. Then this commitment maybe is not really strong commitment. You, you really think that this can be reduced to particles, but because some limitation, cognitive or formal limitation, you introduce this directly inside the domain of quantification, you can say something about that. Okay, we'll skip uh, the other two examples and go to, to the conclusion. Then to conclude, uh, multidisciplinarity, um, in my experience, uh, is really helping in finding a new solution to some uh, representation problem. And for me, the idea to, when you develop a model in general, but especially when you develop a high-level model like this uh, foundation ontologies have, it's important to look inside all 
you can manage it to know. And then, and then philosophy, linguistic, computer, uh, cognitive side, I would say, are really, and there are a lot of inspiration in reading them. And as I said, the choice of a formal language is delicate, as, uh, as I try to illustrate, because of this analytical and applicative role that we have, and then the formal language has and the difficulty to, to really separate and uh, to consider two different languages, one for the analysis and the other for the application. And this is something that uh, I don't have a clear idea now. And uh, I think that also mm, mm, the, the, the idea of the library is, is an interesting one, because at this point you don't need to really commit to a single and monolithic ontology and then to convince everybody that they need to comply with this monolithic ontology, but to leave people free to choose a specific view they have, and uh, at the same time, uh, not uh, uh, just arbitrary view, let's say, but you can have a set of uh, views of, that are quite well studied, and then you leave the, 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 the user free to choose between uh, this view, among this view, and uh, without losing the possibility to integrate uh, the system is developing, with different uh, system based on different ontology. And this also is interesting because the library of ontology is integrated. All the ontology are in, in, interlinked as, as much as possible, clearly. But clearly, this has a, a high cost because you need to develop several ontologies, take into account this multidisciplinarity uh, with a rich axiomatization. You need to integrate them, then to, to introduce map between mapping between them. And then this, you need to, 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 to explain to user what are the, the, the main uh, characteristics of this ontology in order to help the user to choose among them. And then, uh, and, then and, and, and this is clearly quite costly, but uh, as Nicola often says, <laughs> yes, it is hard, but uh, why should it be easy? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Claudio. I mean, you covered a lot of ground there, and I really appreciate that you went to the effort to do that. So now, you talk about this library of ontologies, and I think you also mentioned the, the proliferation of ontologies are, that are out there right now. So a couple of questions about this library. Is the Laboratory for Applied Ontology working on being the, um, the gatherer or, or um, promoter of this library? Well, uh, yes and not, in the sense that basically we have a very we are a, a very small laboratory, and we don't have the energy to, to clearly <laughs> have a library and consider all the the possible ontologies and include them inside the library. Also, because this requires a lot of works because you need to integrate. But in the context of this new onto Commons. Um, uh, project, uh, the idea is, uh, as I said, is exactly the same. Okay, the idea is to to basically have um, a library of ontologies and then to integrate not only um, Dolce and Buffett was partially also integrated uh, already, but now the, the axiomatization change and the in principle we need to redo everything, but also other ontologies. And yeah, we have. Uh, a little bit more resources in order to do that. In addition to that, for example, also in the Colorado repository, there are already some modules interlinked between among them, and then you can play and plug in modules, extend modules, uh, combine modules, and this kind of stuff. Then we are not uh, directly, um, let's say, uh, managing the library ontology, maybe then <laughs> we don't want to move from the ontology to the library. Okay, maybe also this is why. But uh, we are trying to, let's say, um, uh, still uh, consider and this as a, a, a nice idea and then collaborate with people in order to try to, to integrate together different kind of top level ontology. That now, different from 2003, um, there are much more. Okay? There are UF4, there are Tupper, there are GF4, there are other um, interesting um, 
kind of uh, different uh, interesting foundation ontologies. Okay, well, are you going to help, or is the Laboratory for Applied Ontology going to help in developing some, uh, I don't want to call them standards, but guidelines for developing ontology so that the goal of having this library of, of reusable interoperable ontologies could be uh, realized? You, know, you, mean, I'm sorry. you mean to have some kind of methodologies in order to develop uh, let's say, a foundation ontology well, and how to integrate inside a uh, library and blah, 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 this kind no, of stuff? No, not necessarily methodology, but one of the deficiencies that is, is occurs very often is that there's fails to be ex a sufficient explanation either a of the domain or the assumptions that are being made about a particular domain or when you get to the individual elements in the ontology uh, uh, adequate or sufficient natural language definitions as to the intent of how the term should be interpreted because as you point out uh, if you try and do things in, in first order logic or modal first order logic or common logic, those are not usually useful in an ap actual application because among other things, the uh, computation time required. But when they get translated into, at this point, the only commercial viable representation language, OWL, you lose a lot. So in that translation down to a less expressive language, you don't necessarily have the axiomatization to convey or to represent the in initial intent of the yes. term or element. So are you going to help or is the Laboratory for Applied Ontology going to help work in trying to come up with these guidelines so that people would create better ontologies? But you, uh, I'm not sure to understand the point because sure, you, you are right, uh, uh, I don't have solution in this approximation, let's say, going from first order, for example, to how, okay, I don't have real um, comments on that, uh, it's, it's a problem, okay. Then one, one, one thing is to have a good documentation of your ontology, and then yeah. this documentation can be done in natural language, uh, this was we try to do also in the Wonderweb project and for Deutsche, also for the other ontologies. Then there is a description of all the categories, there is the description of all the relations, and there is the description of what are the main, um, the main uh, basic comments you are doing, and, blah, blah, blah. and this can help, but clearly this can well, only help. It does not solve the problem. Okay. Then uh, there is, there was, I think I, I say that, okay, and then, then, then the ontology are kind of linked, justified, documented, and positioned with respect to a space of possible choices. Also, this space of possible choices, for example, that I illustrated in this picture, for example, with just uh, an example, okay, are you three dimensional or four dimensional? Also, yeah, there are a lot of work to, to be done, but we cannot do that. There is also this international association, IO, yeah, International Association for Ontology and, and application, this application, that uh, basically take into account also um, the or tries to, because uh, I mean, the community is quite small at the end, okay, to try to, try to take into account also, for example, the educational perspective, how can you do in order to educate students uh, to have courses and that try to explain uh, that the modeling uh, activities is not easy, you need to learn in order to do some modeling, okay, but this quite big uh, uh, goal. Uh, Yes, definitely. Now, um, I could hog all the time with questions, but other people on the call uh, would like to ask some questions. So John Soa has his hand up and he's first in line. So John. Okay. Uh, one point I wanted to make is that uh, uh, the point that OWL is efficient is absolutely false. OWL does nothing to make proofs more efficient. Uh, in fact, the proof procedures in first order logic are far and away more efficient than any proof procedure implemented for OWL. The only thing that OWL does is to make it impossible to state certain kinds of uh, statements that would, uh, that would take a long time. 
And so if you simply use first order logic uh, for proving everything that uh, is done with OWL, you will uh, automatically be far and away more efficient with FOL proof procedures than you would with OWL. The only thing that OWL does is to make it impossible to make certain statements. Now, uh, if you avoid making those statements in, uh, in common logic or in OWL, the proof procedures, uh, the proof methods used with those languages run faster than the proof methods used with OWL. So don't, uh, so don't consider OWL as a, as a good ontology language. I keep emphasizing that it's a rinky-dink language and that's not on the goal for future development. The goal for future development is to automate ontology development as far as possible so that people never ever have to use uh, a language or logic that they don't understand. They can just state it in uh, their preferred language or logic, whatever it may be, and it and the methods developed for Dole and uh, uh, can you be used for automatically relating these different languages. And that's why I consider Dole to be the direction for the future, far more efficient than any of these uh, uh, proof uh, than uh, trying to uh, st standard <clears throat> standardize PLOs. How I consider a dead end language. Uh, people can continue to use it if they like it, but I do not consider that as a get wave of the future. The wave of the future is automated and semi-automated uh, software development and ontology development. And uh, the idea that you have to standardize on anything like OWL is just a dead end. I, I consider that it, it's just a, a very bad idea from the beginning and uh, no, no need for it. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Uh, Ravi, do you have a question of Claudio? Yeah, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. <clears throat> okay, I, I just uh, am a novice compared to a lot of people uh, who have studied these things in detail. But my question is, um, Claudio, what are we trying to do with this so much of theory and so much of axioms uh, given six rules that you described in the beginning for Dolce. Are you trying to say that Dolce would help you create a new kind of O, that quoted O, the, the big circle O ontologies that will someday be useful? Or are you saying that we already know how to make them useful and we have a problem of selecting a language because I see a lot of things tied in your your presentation, wonderful presentation, but I still do not get what the end target of this O ontology is. Is it to go to a domain level eventually or an instance or solve some new kinds of problems? So I have asked you a lot of questions. Okay, Ravi? Yeah. First, in the beginning part of your question, were you referring to slides either two or three when Claudio uh, gave a, a rough outline of what's included in Dolce? Yes. Okay. And then the second one was you referring to this library of ontologies that Claudio no, talked about? No, I am referring to this so-called funny, oh, you know, I don't know oh, how to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... So what is the, how do you use things like first order logic, things like natural language? Uh, how do you relate these to entities and relations? What What is the end game of this so-called big O ontology? Okay. <clears throat> Like, I, I'm not sure to correctly understand your question, but I can try to answer. And then if you are not happy, you tell me, okay? <laughs> and the idea, the idea is, uh, is that, as, uh, as uh, you can see in the slide eight, okay? And the idea is that uh, and this kind of ontologies, on one side, because they are not unique, and then basically are capture one very general view. For example, the distinction between, if you, if you believe there are, uh, three-dimensional entities or five, four-dimensional entities, for example. This is a quite basic uh, high-level ontological choice. 
okay? And uh, in, in some cases, in some, in some aspects, these two views are uh, incompatible, in other aspects are partially compatible. So can, you can restate something written in, in, in according to a three-dimensional uh, ontology in something written in a four-dimensional logic. Then this kind of, of uh, distinction are quite difficult and quite uh, to, to capture. Then first of all, we ne you need to um, and precisely define what you intend for three-dimensional ontology and four-dimensional ontology. And for this, a rich axiomatization, if you want to be uh, precise, for me, is really useful and maybe is necessary. Then this is the idea of having a very rich axiomatization because the, the notion that you are considering are very subtle, are very difficult, are general. And then if you need, it, if you want to compare uh, to a different position, you need to clarify this position as much as possible. Then for me, formalization is one tool in order to clarify this position in a precise way. Said that, okay, let's suppose now to have this kind of this one this one ontology with this uh, cycle o, okay that uh, that represent in a good way a specific uh, ontological view on uh, or a specific reality if you want a specific view whatever you call it. now how can you use this one because it's quite general often is not uh, is not uh, enough in order to develop a more specific kind of ontology you want to use inside your application then the idea is when you develop a model, in a lot of cases that I touched with my hand, okay, and that I really was involved in uh, in project uh, doing the develop that was aimed at developing some very specific models. What you do often is uh, you just uh, contact the expert of the domain, and the expert of the domain already know basically in the, they read the, the models and they come out come out with a model of that without thinking about that, without founding this modern ground, this modern in more general notion. Then the idea is instead of starting from scratch every time you do a model, you can use all the kind of analysis and basic distinction at the, you have introduced at the level of this uh, ontology cycle, ontology, foundation ontologies, let's call them, okay? In order to, first of all, not start from scratch, and second, to avoid to have some ad hoc solution or some wrong. There are a lot of recurrent modeling problems that you can avoid uh, relying on this kind of ontology. And then there is a sort of a methodological and um, a conceptual um, um, idea behind these ontologies. As, and they can also be used, as I said, in order to to develop some uh, more conceptual model language and then language like UML that has, is more or less uh, neutral with respect to the, the kind of ontological um, uh, commitment you have, in order to, to make more explicit, okay, some kind of... of uh, of constraint you have, for example, different kind of classes, not just one kind of class, different kind of relations that you can add in, in this kind of conceptual modeling language. And this is another use of this kind of ontology has been done, for example, by Giancarlo, uh, Giac uh, Giancarlo Guizzardi in this onto UMM language. That is exactly this, is based on the UFO ontology that uh, is uh, de developed by Giancarlo himself that is quite close to, to the Deutsche ontology. I don't know if I answered at least partially to your question, Ravi. A little bit, yes, Claude. Uh, Ravi? I am limited by my own knowledge also in this. So thank you for trying. I will ask more <laughs> questions if time permits later. OK, thank you. Oh. Surely. Thank you so much. Yes, Claudio, thank you for taking the time and giving us this wonderful presentation. But we are past our meeting time, and I think other people or people have other things they need to do, unfortunately. So again, thank you very much. And Kenneth. Okay.
Many thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. And I'm going to.